Uh, so welcome back, and today, or the, this, uh, today, this morning, late morning, we're taking up the, you know, a, a second a leg to the stool of, uh, of this modern, this relatively new, or at least intensified phenomenon of uh, rapid district court uh, decisions often brought by states against uh, the uh, United States for federal implementation of, of federal law. And it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Sam Bray and uh, Dave uh, Engstrom. Both of them are uh, good friends of mine and colleagues. Uh, uh, Sam was uh, one of my law clerks, which makes me very uh, proud, and uh, also uh, was a uh, uh, executive director of my Constitutional Law Center at Stanford years ago before starting out in, at UCLA, uh, moving uh, now to University of Notre Dame where he is a, a tenured professor of constitutional law and remedies and injunctions and he is the nation's leading expert on uh, the topics that we're going to be talking about. Uh, Dave Engstrom is my uh, colleague at Stanford uh, Law School. Uh, and a, uh, one of the nation's great experts on administrative law. And so I appreciate both of you coming out. And uh, take it away, Sam. So I want to talk about what are often called uh, nationwide injunctions or national injunctions or universal injunctions or global injunctions or non-party injunctions. Lots of different names for this phenomenon. Um, this is closely related to what Professor Grove was talking about. One conventional account of the life cycle of a lawsuit is that there's the question of who gets into court, um, standing is the technical name, then there's the merits, like whether you win in court, and then there's what comes out the other end, and that's the remedy. So if you think about this phenomenon as a whole, um, neither Professor Grove nor I are taking up the, the merits questions in the middle. But she's focused on that initial question of who can get into court, and I'm focused on that logically um, at the end question about what comes out the other end and what the scope of the remedy is. You can tie these together in various ways, or you can think about them separately, but that sort of maps out how um, these contributions fit in the life cycle of a lawsuit. The challenge for this topic is it is something that is on the front page of the newspaper and has been for the last four and a half years. And it is exceedingly technical at bringing in many legal doctrines that are, uh, um, uh, are uh, arcane. Um, and yet it also touches on basic questions of our constitutional design, including separation of powers and federalism, things that are not just the domain of lawyers, but since the Constitution belongs to all of us, are questions of concern for everyone in this room. So there's no way I can, with the uh, skill and grace and aplomb of Professor Grove, transcend all of the, the, the range from the very technical to the very accessible. So what I will do is I will, I will concede that my, my talk is going to be too technical for some of you and insufficiently technical for others of you, and the Q&A is going to have to take up the slack. But as long as you don't hit me over the head with a book, I'll be happy. I will not. I will not. I will not. Uh, yes. So first, a definition. The national injunction. Uh, what I mean by that is an injunction, so an order from a court to do something or not do something, in a non-class action. So we're not talking about a class of people suing. We're talking about individuals or states, so not a class action. Um, an injunction in a case like that that constrains how the federal government acts toward everyone. Notice I didn't define it in terms of uh, space. It applies everywhere in the country. I defined it in terms of people. That applies to everyone. So it's applying not just to the parties, but to everyone. Um, that national injunction has basically stopped all the major initiatives of the presidents in the last two years of uh, President Obama's second term and in the first uh, two years of President Trump's uh, administration. 
When Attorney General Barr gave a speech about a month ago, he said there had been 36 national injunctions against the Trump administration. Now, there are many grounds for critiquing the national injunction. It's novelty. It has no basis in the historic powers of the federal courts. Um, it is, I believe, though many scholars would disagree with this, inconsistent with the uh, judicial power granted by Article III of the Constitution because it involves the court not in deciding the case or controversy of the parties, but instead in giving a remedy that is uh, um, external to the parties. It's an end run around class actions. We do have this device for bundling together lots of different claims and deciding them all together, the class action. Uh, this is a way of trying to get the benefit of a class action without submitting to the requirements of a class action. And then there are a number of policy problems with the national injunction. And these are what resonate most with um, many non-lawyers. So one is the forum shopping idea. You just go pick out the judge you want, especially if you can find a place where there's only one judge, when you, and then you know who you're going to get when you file your suit. And that has happened for many of the, the Republican-flavored national injunctions. Um, there's an asymmetry in effect. If you win and get a national injunction, it controls how the federal government acts toward everybody. If you lose, it doesn't matter. Somebody else can file another one. There's no, the winning is winning and losing isn't losing. And that's not the way it's supposed to work in a lawsuit. So that's another policy problem. Another is that you don't get the opinions of lots of different courts of appeals that might be ideologically diverse. You only get the ones that plaintiffs file national injunction cases in. So you don't get what is called percolation. And there can be conflict between national injunctions. So there are all those problems. You can work through them in detail. That's not going to be my focus today. My focus is going to be on the future of the national injunction we could say colloquially, how is it going to go down? So um, that's, that's what I'd like to focus on. Three points for that. So first point is that I think in the long run, it is not politically tenable to have a Congress that doesn't legislate and an executive who can't do anything because of national injunctions. So I think in the long run, our political system will not tolerate that degree of paralysis. Uh, legislating in the sense of making laws, whether happening through a legislature or not, has to happen in the long run in a republic. It's going to happen. And if Congress isn't going to do it and the executive steps in to do it and the courts won't let the executive do it, then there's going to be enormous pressure. Um, so I think that pressure is going to have to be resolved some way. I think uh, given the, the fact that at any particular moment, the national injunction is a highly partisan issue, uh, that we're going to get no traction now with um, uh, Democratic House, Republican president. And the Rules Committee is not going to do anything about it. So I think the change is going to have to come from the Supreme Court. And I think that is likely to happen. I am cautiously optimistic that the Supreme Court will um, knock down, knock out, at least rein in. But I think probably, uh, on the surface, kill off the national injunction. But um, if the court is going to do that, that leads to the third point, which is how is the court going to do that? And here there's a menu of options. And this gets a little technical uh, in terms of legal doctrine, but it's completely unavoidable here. But part of the problem is there are, there are different paths the court can take, and each one has its own pros and cons. And it's not clear what the court's going to do. So, so one way to do this, the kind of modest approach, is what we might call remedial tailoring. The court could just say the remedy has to be tailored to the needs of the parties. It shouldn't be any more burdensome than necessary. Now, if the court does that, uh, it's modest because it doesn't have to get into like big constitutional arguments. It doesn't have to do a lot of history. It can just present this as a, a common sense rule of remedies. Um, and the court leaves itself an escape valve 
Like, what if something comes along where there's a really egregious case and the court wants the lower court to be doing a national injunction? The court could say, well, in this case, it really is necessary. It's not more burdensome than necessary. Um, so the court could, could go with this solution. The problem with knocking down the national injunction as a matter of remedies doctrine, remedial tailoring, is this doctrine is already in place. Already, courts are not supposed to give remedies more burdensome than necessary. And in fact, this is quoted and cited by most of the courts giving national injunctions when they give them. So they, what they say is something like, uh, this, is a, uh, this is an executive policy that applies throughout the nation. Um, it doesn't just apply to the plaintiffs. And so to really remedy the violation, since the violation is national, the remedy needs to be national. And there, you've just slipped the bands of that doctrine and it did nothing to constrain the national injunction. In fact, it was fueling it. So I, I think that's gonna uh, be one way to get, the court could go, but it's, it's got its weaknesses. A second way the court could go is to say that the national injunction is inconsistent with traditional equity. There are many Supreme Court cases from the last uh, 25 years that have emphasized equity, equitable rules, distinctions between law and equity, comes up in ERISA cases, comes up in copyright and patent cases about equitable defenses. Um, there's a case from the 90s called Grupo Mexicano where the Supreme Court said that the powers that the federal courts have to give equitable remedies, like injunctions, uh, are granted by the Judiciary Act of 1789. And those powers are the powers that the chancellor traditionally had or powers analogous to those. So all the court would have to say is, this is not a power that, the, that was traditional in equity, so the federal courts don't have it today. So they could do that. Uh, it's easy to write that in terms of precedent. Um, the downside to the court killing off the national injunction that way is, especially given the, the political centrality of the national injunction to our national life, uh, the court should say a little more. And it should actually say something about what traditional equity is and why it matters and why it's a good idea to even be thinking about this. And there are um, scholars writing about why it's a good idea. I'm one of them. But the court, in all of these cases where the court insists on the law equity line, the court has been a little reticent about why. And it wants to just ground that in precedent. Maybe it, the court doesn't want to get out over its skis. Uh, that's a that's an understandable impulse. But if the court's going to strike down national injunctions and say there's no power to do that because of traditional equity, the court should say a little more. And the third avenue the court could take to killing the national injunction is to ground it squarely in the Constitution and to say that Article Three, the judicial power, is the resolution of cases or controversies. There is no freestanding power for courts to right wrongs throughout the world. And the case or controversy requirement doesn't work as a kind of threshold. It's a door where once you get through the door, then it's like broad sunlit uplands of wide judicial discretion to do anything that would, would be good as long as you can get through the door. It actually applies all the way. It's about who can sue. It's about what the court is deciding. And it's about the remedy are all um, governed by the idea of a case. Now, I think that way of going at it might actually get the most votes on the Supreme Court. The uh, partisan gerrymandering case from um, Wisconsin last term, Gill and Whitford, um, was resolved by, with an opinion by uh, Chief Justice Roberts that said, um, you don't have standing to get remedies for other people. 
There are lines in that uh, opinion from which you could draw a straight line to killing off the national injunction. And that opinion, uh, the, or the decision of the court, the judgment of the court in that case, that there was no standing, was unanimous. So you might be able to get a broader set of votes for that. But the problem is twofold. One is, if the court grounds this in Article 3, then it really is reducing its flexibility going forward. Um, I mean, I say that's a problem. That, that, that could be a, a, a wonderful thing. But, but that's uh, certainly a consideration. The second thing is that it would require the court to explain exactly how these doctrinal moving parts fit together. How, what is the relationship between standing and remedies? And there are plenty of cases that suggest there is a relationship, but the court has never been really clear about what that relationship is. And in fact, the last time the court really tried to be clear about that was a case in the 1920s Frothingham and Mellon, um, where the court was anything but clear and people have widely misunderstood it or understood it in very different ways for a long time. So that's a, uh, an expositional task that is hard. So I think um, the disordering of our body politic and of the judicial role of the national injunction is so strong and its deviation from principles like that in Gill, like standing to get a remedy for the plaintiff, is so big that the court is going to do away with it. Um, at, least, at least in name, it's going to say you can't do this. Whether it leaves itself an escape hatch is another question. But I think uh, the court's going to do that. But which path it's going to choose is, um, I think, uh, unsafe to predict. So I will not. Um, I want to mention two things in closing that should give us pause. So one is Jennifer's question, Jennifer Arlen, Professor Arlen's question. Um, we live in an era of executive overreach. And by that, I do not mean only um, executives are using informal power and soft power and going around the requirements for issuing rules. That's, that's true, and that's a serious rule of law problem. But I have in mind another problem, which is um, the executive is increasingly the lawmaking organ of the government. So even if the executive followed like all the rules to issue the rules, um, the energy for lawmaking is the executive. Increasingly, that is what our national elections are about. It's like, which laws do you want? Well, if you want these laws, you should, el you should elect this president who will give you these laws. Uh, but of course, I, I hope I don't have to say for this room that uh, that is not the constitutional design. Congress is supposed to pass the laws. The president is supposed to execute the laws. So. The deeper question here is what you do when one branch is exceeding its constitutional bounds. And there are basically two ways to go at this. One is to say one constitutional re overreach should be countered by another. In law professor terms, this is called hydraulic adjustment. Um, but we could say two wrongs make a right. So uh, this is a completely understandable reaction. Um, that is not my reaction, though. I am, tend to be skeptical of hydraulic adjustment, because once you do it, then uh, way leads to way, and it will beget still more adjustments, and you get further and further from the constitutional design. So if you think the constitutional design is wise or legitimate or both, then you should be skeptical about um, a trend toward a lot of hydraulic adjustment. So I'd rather turn around and go backwards if we make in the wrong turn rather than try to match it. So that's the deeper question at issue here. Um, the other thing I would like to close with about um, how this happened is about legal culture. And here I want to echo in a way um, Will's comments about the, uh, the depth of the roots 
for this manifestation that we're seeing. Um, I think it's not just that we've changed what we want courts to do. We do want courts to be the arbiters of our political disputes. We want courts to sign off and approve of things uh, before they really become policy. Um, so we expect courts to do that. But we've also changed the way we talk about what courts do and conceptualize it. We talk about judges striking down a law. We talk about a facial challenge. Um, these are all comparatively new ideas, new terminology. Um, now, I will admit you can find germs of them, even in Marbury v. Madison. But Marbury mostly presents a different view, which is courts adjudicate disputes. And in the course of adjudicating disputes, they might have to say this is unconstitutional or that is unconstitutional. Yes, very important judicial job. This is one of the reasons judges have life tenure. But what you, um, but the idea is that that is incidental to the resolution of the case. If we shift to thinking that what courts do is they act on something out in the world, they go out and strike it down, or they erase it, or they like knock it out, then we've changed what we think judges are doing, and the national injunction really seems like a like, obvious thing. Why shouldn't judges, if they think this is unconstitutional? and they're supposed to strike it down, why should they let it be up and about, walking around, hurting other people? It's complete, there's a logic to it. But the logic has come from our shift in how we think about what judges do. So at the moment, we're, we're in this unstable time. We have a lot of legal rules and constitutional rules and legal practices that say judges decide a case for these parties. And we have other legal rules and doctrines and our habits of speaking that say judges are supposed to strike things down and that has an, they operate on the laws and that has an effect for everybody. We can't hold these in tension forever. We're gonna resolve it one way or the other. It's an unstable equilibrium. We're gonna move toward a model of judges having a general power that looks more like legislatures or we're gonna move back to uh, judges being more focused on the case. Uh, and one of those two is gonna happen uh, in the next 30 or 40 years, and I have no idea which one it's going to be. I have hopes, but I also have fears. So stay tuned. David, so thank you, Sam. Uh, I'm delighted to be here, and I want to start on a cheerleading note um, and uh, underscore something that Michael said, which is that Sam is, I think he said he's the national expert on the national injunction. And I think that understates matters significantly. Um, in fact, uh, Sam is the one-man Herculean driver of that debate, at least on the scholarly side of things. And I think that's worth noting. And I, I'm just so admiring of what Sam has done because he has done it in such the right way, which is to say early in his career, he wrote a bunch of rigorous and unflashy articles about equity, about remedies. Uh, and it was only later then that he, once he had total command of those areas, that he turned to this question of the national injunction. And what it produced was just a remarkable article in Har Harvard Law Review that is just so rich and so textured. And that is how he has driven this debate. And so as a, as from one legal scholar to another, I, I, do, I do think that, that Sam has, has led this debate and he's, he's truly done it in, in the right way. So I could talk a lot about big think issues. And my guess is that we will get to some of that in the Q&A. Um, as Sam notes in the paper, the national injunction debate does sit at the crossroads of virtually every key trend in American public law. So the rise of executive lawmaking, especially through agency rulemaking, political polarization, the federalism revival and the professionalization of state AGs, and of course the intractable, intractable debate going all the way back to Marbury around judicial self-concept and whether we should think about the federal courts as primarily resolving disputes or declaring law. I'm not gonna talk about any of that. I'm gonna go weedy and, and frankly a little bit technical because that for me is the beating heart of the debate. And I'm gonna focus a lot of my comments around this idea as to whether there might be some intermediate solutions that we should consider. Uh, ways to modulate the use of national injunctions without abolishing them entirely. So I'll lay this out in two steps. First of all, I'll spell out in detail some possible intermediate solutions that we might consider if we want to modulate rather than abolish. Uh, 
And then I'm going to argue that not only might a modulated version of the national injunction be better than abolition, it might be inevitable. And there may be no way around it. Intermediate solutions. What do I mean by that? And why might they be good? Um, the answer as to why they might be good is that there's some tough trade-offs here. Form shopping is really bad. Percolation is really good. National injunctions give you lots of the former and none of the latter. That's one side of the trade-off. But on the other side, you have this problem of claim interdependence and what we would call in the law war world remedial indivisibility. What do you do about a case where fungible tax dollars are at issue? What do you do about a case where plaintiffs are seeking the right to an integrated education? What do you do with the fact that A and B can't fill out different census forms? Or what do you do about a case like the DAPA case, Texas versus United States, where Texas plausibly argued that they needed a broad scope injunction because of the freedom of travel of folks who were given legal status in a different state than Texas? Second problem on that other side of the trade-off ledger is that government can be stubborn. And government can even be bad faith at times. The law might be really settled, but the government could be refusing to appeal or could be pushing through policies against vulnerable non-parties who can't file the individualized suits that they would need to in the absence of a broad scope or even nationwide injunction. Those are the tough trade-offs, and man, are they tough. Okay, there are plenty of good arguments on either side of the ledger there. So maybe we should consider intermediate solutions, and if so, we've got some options. Think about how we regulate anything out in the world. You can regulate entry on the front end. You can regulate effects on the back end. How could we regulate entry? Well, we could limit the availability of a nationwide injunction or national injunction to important or significant cases. We could limit them to cases where there is that need for complete relief, where there's remedial indivisibility or claim interdependence. We could limit them to cases where we need to protect vulnerable non-parties from bad faith government action. That's regulation of entry. What about regulation of effects? If we're worried about form shopping, maybe we should put into place three judge panels. Maybe we could include a venue provision that pushes all requests for national injunctions to a single court, DC, say. You could also imagine an MDL-like consolidation process where we kind of hoover up all the vacuum up, hoover up, uh, hoover up all hoover of the, I didn't good. even plan that, uh, <laughs> hoover up all the cases and, and, and send them and consolidate them in, in a single court. That's how we could try to deal with effects could also try to regulate national injunctions through eligibility requirements. Maybe only certain plaintiffs can seek nationwide injunctions. Maybe that might mean states only could seek a, a nationwide or national injunction. There's a fourth option, though, which is called the ne I call the Neo Park Lane option. And here's where we get a little nitty gritty. So let's go back in time a little bit. Historically, equity did not permit injunctions benefiting non-parties because judges were wary of granting remedies that were broader than the preclusive effect of their judgments. So what the heck do I mean by that? Here's a simple diagram that I actually use with my civil procedure students when I teach preclusion. Back in the day, P2 and P3 and P4 and P5, they couldn't piggyback on P1's earlier judgment against a defendant. And so the thought was, at equity, that an injunction shouldn't issue that had the same effect by benefiting P2. But in 1979, we get a case from the Supreme Court called Park Lane, and that opens the door to something called offensive non-mutual collateral estoppel. And there the court said, P2 can sometimes invoke preclusion against D, so long as P2 is not acting in bad faith by adopting a wait and see approach and thus free riding on P1's effort. And the concern is that P2 would sit and wait and hope to duck an adverse judgment against P1 or get the benefit of a positive judgment, a favorable judgment for P1. So it was a constraint on strategic action. 
post park lane, of course, and junctions can expand accordingly because they can be entered coincident with the preclusive effect under park lane, uh, the slightly more preclusive effect of a judgment. Here's the problem, which is that today's national injunctions go well beyond the preclusive effect of a judgment against the government because of a case called Mendoza, it's a 1984 case, which holds that offensive non-mutual collateral estoppel is never available against the federal government. Rationale is familiar. Part of what concerned the court was the need for percolation. We don't want preclusion against the government because we want important cases against the government to percolate. There's also this concern about locking in one administration against another administration. That's what, that's what Mendoza held, no preclusion. If we overrule Mendoza, though, we could bring remedies, including the national injunction, and preclusion into alignment. And then we could use a park line, park lane-like set of factors to modulate national injunctions. And the result would be a new test. Anytime someone comes into court and seeks a national injunction, the court would ask, hey, is this one of those cases where an overbroad or broad injunction is necessary for complete relief? Are these forum shopping plaintiffs? Are they waiting and seeing? Are they hoping to duck the, the bad effect of, a, of an adverse judgment, but hoping to get the benefit of a positive judgment of a prior P? How good or bad faith is the government acting in this case? Right? Is this one of these settled legal questions? Is the government actually genuinely seeking to vindicate its position? Is it maybe strategically refusing to appeal cases? Is it pushing through policies against vulnerable non-parties who can't file those individualized suits themselves and would need the protection of a broad injunction? Best of all, to my mind, by way of an intermediate solution, with Mendoza's overrule, we don't need as many national injunctions. And here's why. The park lane approach, the possible that you might get preclusion and you might not, actually pushes plaintiffs to bring cases as class actions under Rule 23b2. This is the part of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure that makes class action available for, a, for plaintiffs seeking injunctive relief. So this approach disincentivizes strategic avoidance of class certification, which a lot of parties seeking national injunctions are doing. Moreover, parties who fall outside of the B2 class action, maybe their claims aren't yet ripe, they get the benefit of Park Lane preclusion later. There's no need to protect them now with an overly broad injunction. So this Neo Park Lane approach and Rule 23, they actually work nicely in tandem. Okay, this is the mother of all intermediate solutions. It's less than perfect, but my view is it might be best, and it might also be a stable approach going forward. Indeed, if you look at how judges apply offensive non-mutual collateral estoppel outside the nationwide injunction context, obviously, they uh, grant preclusion roughly, uh, actually less than 50% of the time. So judges are fairly judicious in applying these factors. Okay. Second and final slide. Here's, the, here's, uh, here's where I'm going with this. Sam rejects all intermediate solutions in favor of abolition, but I think once we understand the guts of intermediate solutions, their possibilities, what they would actually look like, it allows us to ask some key questions. So the first question to my mind is, just how far apart are Sam and I on this? Okay, I read at least two About of- About five feet. Correct. I read, I, read, I read Sam's uh, uh, exit options, at least two of them, as closer to presumptions rather than absolutes. Okay, so he talked about remedial tailoring as a possibility, but he himself concedes in the paper that that might admit of some exceptions. And what would those exceptions look like? They might look a lot like Neo Park Lane factors. Similarly, if we required national injunctions to be traceable to the history of equity, a second exit option, a second way a court could abolish the national injunction, I would say that the history of equity might be a little muddier than Sam is claiming. Um, they've, equity courts grappled with claim interdependence and remedial indivisibility. 
and in cases involving bills of peace, municipal corporations, tax cases, not to mention the fact that the government enjoyed sovereign immunity until 1976, and so you had this officer suit work around. This is really weedy now, but it makes it really hard to draw clean inferences from that history of equity. What does that mean? Applying these two exit strategies, again, courts could end up at more or less the same place as a neo park lane approach where we squarely ask, is this the type of case that would justify a nationwide injunction? So we already noted that national injunctions sit at the intersection of virtually all of American public law, but they also sit at a much narrower nexus of three incredibly important doctrines, scope of remedy, standing, and class actions. And so the national injunction debate is part of this very tightly woven fabric. And the idea is if you just pull one thread of that fabric, it's going to have an effect elsewhere in the fabric of doctrine. And so I think this invites us to imagine a world without national injunctions, right? Suppose Sam gets his way and we do abolish national injunctions. What would result? I think one result is that it would raise the stakes significantly of state standing. So I would love to hear Tara's perspective on this, but it might mean that states are really the only plaintiffs that can reliably get wide scope injunctions. And the system could operate around a set of, you could call them half national injunctions with phalanxes of red and blue state state AGs as the arbiters. Some of you might think that's good. I think it's probably bad because uh, for a lot of the uh, reasons that Tara articulated during the, the, the prior panel. I have concerns and, and I may, might even believe that states deserve less solicitude than private parties. The key point, point though is we'll still have broad and even overbroad injunctions and we might still want to modulate the, t the, 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 the types of claims that states, uh, for which states can get a nationwide injunction. Second possibility, if we abolish national injunctions, it places enormous pressure on Rule 23 and B2 class actions. There are advantages. At the least, it uh, harnesses the nationwide injunction to Rule 23 strictures. It closes the asymmetry and preclusion that currently exists with the nationwide injunction, but it comes at a cost. I think it promotes a lot of judge overreach if there's no recourse for vulnerable non-parties or plaintiffs with unright claims, then it incentivizes judges, maybe blue state judges, to overreach. It also creates a predictability, malleability problem. If we get rid of the national injunction and load everything on to Rule 23, we are going to be running the inquiry about the proper scope of remedies through the clunky machinery of Rule 23's commonality requirement. And this is way far abstracted from all of the normative concerns that we have about nationwide injunctions, forum shopping, wait and see plaintiffs, vulnerable non-parties. And I think we might end up with something that's actually more malleable and less administrable than a Neo Park Lane approach. The bigger point, We'll still have national injunctions or something close via a lot of blue state bending of Rule 23b2. Another way of putting all this, wide scope injunctions in one form or another may be inevitable. And I personally think that an intermediate solution built around a well-tailored version of this Park Lane test might be better than the alternatives. That's my weedy, over-technical take. Um, uh, thanks again to Sam for a terrific paper and importantly for, and more importantly for, for powering uh, such a critical national debate and I look forward to the conversation. Sam, you have some responses? Gladly. So um, I'm grateful to Professor Ingstrom for the gracious and insightful words and I, this is an example of something that does move the debate forward rather than just rehashing the, the questions about it, are they good or bad, looking for like actually where the uh, where the law could go from here, and that is uh, that has been missing in a lot of the the debate to this point. Um, I agree that there is a tightly interwoven fabric of many different doctrines, 
But as we think about that tightly interwoven fabric, it's worth noting just how new this central place for the national injunction is. So if you go back to the individual mandate suit against the Affordable Care Act, I believe it was 26 states, 27 states, something like that, sued. Um, so the individual mandate under uh, Obamacare. Um, there was no request for a national injunction. They didn't even think about asking for a national injunction. Now, there had been a few before then, and they go back to the middle of the 20th century, but they're marginal, and they're sort of accidental, and they're not at the center of our life. They have, they have gone from zero to 60, or maybe from two to 60, in uh, the last five years. So there is this tightly interwoven doctrinal fabric that does not include the national injunction. And then it is the departure, putting it in, rather than we have this tightly interwoven fabric with it, and pulling it out is this, this change we have, to, we have to deal with. So I won't respond to each point, but I want to respond to three. So one is the question of um, indivisibility and when we need uh, to go beyond the, uh, the plaintiffs in giving the remedy. So I think of this as how is one case supposed to ripple out to other cases? Because you could take from my talk that I think each case, each judge, each set of plaintiffs are supposed to stay in their own lane and there's no effect on anybody else. I do think there's an effect on other people. But the main way that is supposed to happen is through precedent. So the example of tax collection, I think that gets dealt with through precedent. Um, another way to do it is through class actions. So uh, Rule 23 has a kind of class action that is designed for desegregation suits. And so that's why most desegregation suits were brought as class actions, not as uh, one plaintiff seeking an injunction. Those were very unusual. Most of them are class actions. So we don't need something like the national injunction to be able to tie those cases together. Um, on the question of bad faith, I do not like executive bad faith one bit, and I don't want to hamstring the courts in dealing with it. So one way that courts can deal with it is through contempt. When they do give an injunction representing one or more particular parties, and that is not complied with, and I think the court should be vigorous about contempt against the executive. Um, but there's also a difficulty with bad faith because it can easily be in the eye of the beholder. So if the president has, and I'm, by the president, I do not mean this particular president. I'm speaking generically of a president in our constitutional system, has a different view of the law or a different view of the Constitution. Does the president have to fold the first time there is a judicial decision going the other way. So this has been a major question in our politics going back to at least the 1850s, the, the Lincoln-Douglas debates we heard about before. Um, and that's a really big question and important one. And I don't want to say that it's bad faith by an executive to disagree with the courts. So how can you tell which one is which? That turns out to be rather tough. Come back to that in just a moment. So the last point is the neo-Park Lane preclusion. Um, idea. And I do, think, um, I do think David presents this well, but I have some concerns. So uh, one concern is I, I think Park Lane is wrong, and I, I actually wouldn't have preclusion go beyond the parties. Um, the second is even if you accept Park Lane, Mendoza, the U.S. versus Mendoza case from the early 80s, is a, is a teed up the exact question, should this happen for the federal government? And the Supreme Court said no, because we need things like percolation and everything else. So we have asked the question, should we extend the Park Lane model to the federal government? And we have decided no. Now, of course, being law professors, we are not bound by the precedents that exist. And so, so we can argue, uh, just like I argue that Park Lane should be reversed. You can argue Mendoza should be reversed. So, so this is no knockout argument for me. So should we do the Park Lane test? Um, and I think here the problem is Park Lane is built for private law. And it's built for cases where we can look and see what good faith is and bad faith, and we can figure it out. And it does. it's not this like, tectonic plates in our polity about what the executive should do 
And so it's just a test that's designed for something very different. And so what I think will happen is it will be very malleable, especially when you combine it with forum shopping. Can you pick out a judge who thinks the executive is acting in bad faith? Well, that's not too hard. And so I think what will happen is you'll, you'll just recreate the exact same set of problems. So I think it'll shift them around, but we'll be in the same place. Now, I do think uh, David is right that it would be better to have the part Neo Park Lane than to have national injunctions, and they all happen through national classes. I actually don't think we should switch to class actions nationally for every question. I, I think that's not a good thing either. So um, um, I think class actions work better at the state level and the local level than they do nationally. Uh, so I wouldn't want to see that swap out. So, so I'm afraid I'm, I'm in the position of having to, despite a eloquent and persuasive alternative, having to stick to my guns. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm going to uh, be keeping a queue, and there are already several names uh, on it. Uh, but again, I want to ask a couple of questions, although in this case I want to ask one question of both of them, but with an example that I think should be challenging, you know, differentially challenging to the two. Uh, but to my mind, the heart of the debate that we've just been hearing is really about a remedial uh, indivisibility, as, as uh, Dave, so I'd never heard that term before. It's a great term. But the idea of remedial indivisibility is you cannot give full relief to the actual party in the case without enjoining the defendant everywhere the defendant acts. And so, you know, uh, Texas uh, com complains about the DAPA policy because uh, if all these folks are being, uh, are being given uh, legal status, they're going to have to issue driver's licenses. And you can't do that just in Texas because one of them might be in Massachusetts and choose to move to Texas and we're going to have just the same problem. So it has to be nationwide. So that's the problem. And I think it is a serious problem for Sam's position because uh, if uh, you have to give a nationwide injunction in order to fully protect the party to the case, then you haven't accomplished anything by adopting his proposal, which if I understand it is we should only allow the court to give full relief to the party of the case. It's, it's just not going to do anything. Um, so with that, I, I really think that's the heart of the debate. And two examples. So what I think is going to be a problem for Sam in particular is what about the Administrative Procedure Act? A lot of these cases are brought under the Administrative Procedure Act. And when a plaintiff brings such a case, they usually challenge either the procedures, things like lack of notice and comment and so forth, uh, or they claim that the regulation is arbitrary and capricious. But either way, uh, the act provides that the remedy is to remand to the agency to uh, reconsider its regulation or to obey the procedural requirements or whatever it is. It seems to me that by, by its nature, the relief in an APA case is nationwide and goes and it goes beyond the party because the relief is to remand to the agency and so that benefits or hurts you know the whole world uh, and not just the so I'm, I'm wondering how Sam how your proposal uh, interacts with the APA and if the answer is the APA is an exception because Congress did this Congress set forth these remedial provisions uh, doesn't that cut, shoot a huge gaping hole in your normative position since so many of these cases are brought under the APA? My other example, um, and using actually David mentioned DAPA as one of his examples of remedial indivisibility, but I don't understand why all these things are quite so remedially indivisible. Uh, take DAPA. Uh, it's true that people given one of these legal status in Massachusetts might move to Texas. But what's wrong with tying the remedy to the, to the particular injury that is the basis for standing in the case? So if the basis for standing is driver's licenses, 
instead of enjoining DAPA and stopping the whole Obama administration, you know, program, why doesn't the court just issue an injunction saying that Texas has the authority to deny driver's licenses to people even, you know, even if they have one of these laminated cards? I mean, doesn't that solve Texas's only problem? Uh, but and it's nationwide in a sense, in that it'll apply to people from Massachusetts too, but it's still confined only to Texas. And it seems to me similarly, if you look at uh, uh, Trump versus Hawaii, even if you grant what I think is really a, an incorrect theory of standing for the University of Hawaii, why don't we just issue an injunction saying, okay, Hawaii, you win, and if there's a student or a faculty member in Iraq that you, you know, that you've admitted and you want to have come, you're entitled to uh, have them considered for a visa, you know, on the ordinary criteria, notwithstanding the, the executive order. Uh, but only then. But we're not going to disrupt the Trump administration's, you know, entire policy on on immigration. So. That's my question. So um, I don't think there is a lot of remedial indivisibility. Um, I am not bothered by a remedy benefiting non-parties as long as no part of the remedy is constructed for non-parties. So let me give a kind of mundane example. If there is, uh, if the water that's coming to your house is, um, is contaminated, now, there, there are good ways to go at this systemically. You should get state regulators involved. You should get federal regulators involved. You should sue as a class action for everybody in the city. But let's say you just sue for yourself. You bring your own suit about the water that's coming to you. Um, you should be able to get an injunction. Let's assume you win on liability. You should be able to get an injunction that requires the city water department to give you clean water. Now, there are two ways the city could do that. One way they could do it is to clean up the water at the central uh, water processing plant. The other way they could do that would be to install some kind of mini just for you uh, water facility under the street outside your house. Um, I think all you're entitled to if you bring that suit is that you get clean water. Or again, there are other ways to go at this systemically to deal with it. But if you as an individual litigant sue, you're only entitled to that. Now, the court could give an injunction requiring the city to give you clean water, and then it's up to the city to decide how to do that. And if they decide, well, we're going we're gonna to change the water at the water processing plant, then everybody else benefits. And that's totally fine. Um, so if, it, if they treat it as if it were indivisible, that is up to the enjoined party. But the injunction itself, and you're right, the remedy you get and the remedy you can enforce against them is not about other people. So on I the APA? On the APA, um, so the key language in the APA is it says um, that agency action held to be unlawful is to be set aside. I'm reading that now. It looks a lot like a national injunction. Now, um, there had been, there's a, a new paper. Uh, it is uh, embargoed. I, I'm not allowed to... <laughs> to uh, to tell you uh, the, the name of the paper, but there is a new paper that finds a national injunction before the APA. Uh, but that national injunction was reversed by the Supreme Court. So at the time of the APA, there were no non-reversed national injunctions. It is basically impossible to imagine that what Congress was trying to do with set aside was command the courts to issue national injunctions. Um, Especially since when you look at the objects to that verb, it's things like findings and the record and the agency action. The, the idea basically is the courts are going to be like reviewing the agency adjudications. And what does a court reviewing court do when it finds an adjudication to be wrong? It sets it aside. But that is already assuming an adjudication between parties. So the whole model that's contemplated at the time is agencies are primarily making policy through adjudication, not through rulemaking. Roll Berger has a scholarship on this. That model doesn't change until the 60s. So I think that's just outside of the contemplation of Congress. But statutes can do things that 
the drafters never contemplate. So we do have to deal with the question of what set aside means today. And I think this really just depends on which conception of the judicial power you bring to it. So if you think judges are operating on things out in the world like statutes and rules and actions, then you look at set aside and this is textual support for the national injunction in APA cases and you're completely right, Professor McConnell, it drives a truck through my normative position. But if you bring a different conception of the judicial power to this, informed by Article 3 among other things, and you think, well, the court, of course, can't decide other people's cases, then what it is doing it is setting aside as to the parties that agency action. And there's nothing more that the court could do. Let me make one last note on this, which is that in 2008, the Solicitor General argued in a brief to Supreme Court when the court took a, a question about national injunctions, which it wound up not deciding. The, the Solicitor General's position with the APA was that the the agency action to be set aside, to be reviewed and set aside, was not the rule itself, but the application of that rule to the parties. And that was presented by the SG as a way to square these principles about judicial power with the text of the APA. So I think I agree in principle that in, say, Texas versus United States and the DAPA case, that there's a way to tie the remedy to the particular injury um, that was that was suffered so so you're right you can imagine an injunction that that essentially says you know Texas you you don't have to you know you don't have to issue driver's licenses to folks no matter where they were granted legal status um, I wish I knew better I, I wish I had better command of different fact patterns that that could arise um, so, for instance, what if, what if there was actually a, a federal requirement, a separate federal requirement that they issue those, those driver's licenses? I suppose that, that could end up being a, a, a different case, and, and maybe that case could get handled even by the narrower version of what, of what Tara suggested, which is, which is this, this idea that maybe we should um, key national injunctions to, or broad injunctions to, um, uh, cases affecting actual regulatory autonomy, right? The ability of the state to actually, and, and, and therefore to, to, to preemption. I guess I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss. I, I, I might actually look to Sam and to Tara here to, 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 for, for fact patterns um, that might, might press on that, where there's a remedy that, that can't actually be tied to the, the particular injury. Maybe there's one. Maybe it's the travel ban case, right? So Hawaii needs access to folks for its state university system and um, uh, in order to do that, it needs to enjoin, I don't even know what agency would be, Customs and Border Protection, um, uh, maybe TSA, I don't even know who, who, would, who would block them from entering uh, the country. But um, uh, you could imagine a tailored injunction, and I think, Michael, you suggested that it's not really national, but, but it is, because it has to, um, it has to bind you know, every uh, uh, sort of border crossing. It has, to, it has to bind every place where the agency is, is, is doing its work, else, else uh, again, the, 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 you know, the... Well, my suggestion is just, you know, Hawaii, give us a list of the two or three people that you have admitted, and, mm -hmm. and we'll give them a visa. Uh, okay, uh, but the problem is that people are turning away folks at the airport, right, and, and sending them back. About, and we don't uh, care about them. And so Hawaii, why, doesn't, why doesn't, doesn't that affect Hawaii's supply of folks for its state university system that it wants to draw on, and it needs them in the country in order to do so? So I don't know. I, I have to the say I'm... this works is foreigners who want to go to the University of Hawaii get a student visa to mm -hmm. come. Mm -hmm. So they're sitting over in Baghdad. I see. So they're identifiable at that point, even though they're yeah. sitting you know, beyond the water's edge somewhere. Right. right. Okay. Um, well, so maybe, maybe... Students don't come to this country without a student visa. Mm -hmm. And the travel ban said we're not going to give student visas to people from these eight countries. So maybe this just makes the, the broader point that there are ways to do this, but that we should still modulate the types of nationwide injunctions that can be issued, um, or the types of injunctions that can be issued. They need to be narrowly tailored, and that could mean uh, tied, to the, uh, tied to the particular injury. Uh, and maybe we would even want to entertain uh, a more sweeping or more uh, significant limitation by limiting them to those instances in which the actual regulatory autonomy of the state is being imperiled in some way. Maybe that would be a good kind of off-the-shelf rule that we could apply that would, that would get us a long way 
towards limiting the nationwide injunction in, in some sort of um, uh, you know in some sort of reasonable sensible way I suppose it doesn't necessarily get at the question uh, say of uh, vulnerable uh, non parties um, so I, I do think it's a it's a fix it's a fix that handles at least some of the normative concerns that we might have about uh, abolishing uh, national injunctions um, uh, or, or having them but but I'm not I'm not sure it I'm not sure that it, it I'm not sure that it hits all of the concerns that we have, and so uh, maybe the, the 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 broader point I could make is that there still might be room for an intermediate solution, even if we can solve parts of it through that that kind of tailoring approach. Uh, so I have a queue with Will Bode at its uh, apex. Uh, <clears throat> uh, great. Uh, so two questions, I think, both for Sam, although I'd love to hear Dave's comments on them too. Uh, both about a Supreme Court case called Ex Parte Young, uh, which is over 100 years ago when the Supreme Court first blessed the idea that federal courts would let people come into federal court and sue a state attorney general or state official in his official capacity just to get a general injunction against the operation of state law. <clears throat> so there it was a railroad not wanting to be subject to the state of Minnesota's rate regulations rather than following the then traditional course of just going about their business and when the federal government, when the state tried to, tried to uh, prosecute them, then trying to defend themselves, they said, no, no, we want to run to federal court, get an injunction before we do any of this, and uh, you know, not, even, not even let the law go into effect and not sort of litigate it based on the actual facts of our case, but get this kind of anticipatory relief. Uh, so question one is, isn't that maybe the original sin? Like once we have this structure where people expect people to go into federal court before something goes into effect and get an injunction against the law in the abstract rather than wait for the law to be applied to them, does that, is that what leads us, maybe not ineluctably, but naturally down this course of then having, you know, having them set aside the whole law, all, all this stuff? Uh, and two, so the procedural reform after that case, because then there were a ton of injunctions and everybody got very worried about this and proof that we could have had this conference uh, 100 years ago and it would have been very timely. Uh, the procedural reform was to require all these ex parte young injunctions to be issued by three judge district courts. So you couldn't hand pick a single sympathetic judge to get an injunction against the state regulation. Uh, is that a good way to deal with the national injunction? So let me start with the second question first. The um, three judge court I mean, there are, there are various problems with the three-judge court here. One is uh, if you're not doing a random draw from the judiciary, then it's going to be highly politicized who gets on the national injunction court. Imagine the confirmation hearing. Um, the, uh, but it would deal with some of the policy problems, especially the forum shopping if you do a random draw of, um, of federal judges. Um, the asymmetry would matter a lot. Like, what if you go to the three-judge court and seek a national injunction, and you're Hawaii, and you lose? Okay, so now Washington seeks a national injunction, gets a different draw. Like, do you, can you keep going until you get the national injunction so the losses never count, but the wins do? So that's one potential question. But you could deal with that by saying it's asymmetric. I think one way I would conceptualize that is if you said all the national injunctions have to go through the three-judge court and then it goes to the Supreme Court, is what we're basically trying to do is we're giving up the benefits of percolation and we're trying to get to precedent quickly. And that's a system design question. We could try to get to precedent quickly. Um, the, the concern I would have is that we would, maybe not intellectually, but naturally, then draw from that the lesson that every federal rule or statute has an asterisk on it until it gets blessed by the special three-judge court. And then our practice would be we're moving out of cases, we're moving to a, a revision, a council of revision constitutional court. And that sort of leads back to the first question. So is, the anti, is, the, is Ex parte Young the, natu the, the original sin? Um, interestingly, Ex parte Young does not present itself as a novel decision. It's just continuity with traditional equitable principles uh, that you can protect your property rights by getting an injunction before the enforcement happens. So I tend to conceive of Ex parte Young as an anti-suit injunction. So instead of the, you going to court and attacking the statute, you go to court and say, the statute can't be, I can't be sued by the regulator under the statute. And that is a reason, note who the defendant, 
Oh, I'm sorry. Um, know who the defendant is. It's the attorney general who would bring the enforcement. So um, I think the shift to pre-enforcement challenges has contributed to the basic change in legal culture, though. And most constitutional challenges used to be defenses in criminal cases, not suits for injunctions ahead of time. Jennifer. So this is another really interesting paper. Um, so I want to pick up on this interim middle ground idea and return to our conversation earlier about the fact that a lot of this is driven by people who think that a president, pick your president, is behaving illegal. Right, so this isn't really about individual harm. It's really about somebody's being illegal. And so the question I have is, is there another way of limiting it by saying, well, what we're really talking about is not remedies, but who gets to decide what's <coughs> legal or not, and what's the scope of their decision-making authority? And I think there's an argument that so I have two hypotheticals. One is Trump decides to build a wall, declares a national emergency, and um, let's say er someone in Arizona and Texas sues, and they're both saying what he's doing is illegal. The other, totally making this up obviously, is Obama declares that no African American can, mail it, can marry an Anglo, right? two different uses of executive power. I would think there'd be an argument that if Arizona sues, that court is interpreting the scope of presidential power, but only as far as we give it jurisdiction, which would be the Ninth Circuit if it's in Arizona. And wait, that's right. Ninth if it's Arizona, and I think New Mexico is, Texas I'll make it, is the fifth. All right. And that, like, that can bind all interpretations of the law in the ninth, but it can't bind the fifth because they're not in the fifth. And there's been no Supreme Court interpretation of that law, whereas by contrast, I would argue the Obama law, which I've obviously made up, would fall under David's talk about bad faith. We've got Supreme Court precedent that clearly says this is illegal. And so a court in, say, the 11th Circuit wouldn't be going on the basis of the circuit. It could say, I got the Supreme Court, that's nationwide. It says this law is illegal, so I can do a nationwide injunction because I've got no legal uncertainty. And could you use what is the scope of a judge's right to interpret and bind other courts as the basis of how broad your injunction can go? If so you're on Supreme Court, Unambiguous Supreme Court precedent, no doubt, you get to go nationwide. If there's a basis for reasonable minds to differ about the Supreme Court's interpretation, then you can only bind your circuit. But there's no need for a national injunction when you have unambiguous precedent from the Supreme Court. So you have Loving in Virginia, question is settled by the Supreme Court, you don't need to go nationwide. No federal court will possibly disagree with Loving in Virginia. So I think precedent is the way to deal with it, and precedent has resolved that question. I, do, I would not think uh, we want to have uh, geographic, territorial uh, restrictions on what the court can do. Uh, injunctions run th can run throughout the whole world. That's no problem, as between the parties. Like, if you win a trademark oh, suit, that trade you get an injunction protecting your trademark. I didn't mean as between the parties. Who's... In other words, if you're living in a different circuit and you're trying to say so that law helps me, let, you can't. Let me uh, just intervene here for a second because we have some trains to run on time and another question. May I suggest that the last couple of rows quietly go get lunch and bring them back while we continue this part of the conversation and, uh, and then, uh, and, and, and I want to bring Tara into it who is the last person on our queue list. So I do think precedent operating between circuits is important, and that's a way to get the percolation. So it is true that the precedent from the Court of Appeals, Ninth Circuit would apply in Arizona, but not in Texas. All right. So, so thank you so much for the fascinating discussion. Um, and I, I, love, I, I, I love your work, Sam.
So uh, just a couple of questions that, um, one of which builds on something that Michael said at the beginning of our discussion. And the, this is the idea that soon after the president does something, someone, a state, another party goes to, goes to federal court and immediately gets an injunction. So in, in, all the, in all the discussions that I've seen of, over nationwide, universal, and so on discussions, um, there's less emphasis than I would have expected on the fact that they're preliminary injunctions. And I wonder if the problem is more the preliminary aspect than the nationwide aspect. And I also wonder how inclined would courts be um, if they actually went through a full, uh, full judicial proceeding, whether it's up to summary judgment or even off, up to trial, how inclined they would be to grant a nationwide injunction, because I think that if a court had to examine the issues closely, they would come up with uh, more remedial injunctive solutions um, than they tend to at the beginning with on very, very few facts. I do think it's remarkable that the uh, national injunctions against the Obama administration and the Trump administration have been preliminary injunctions. I think that's important. Um, you might not have expected me to say good things about the national injunction, but I, I do think the preliminary injunction is a little complicated, the preliminary national injunction, because part of what the preliminary injunction is supposed to do is preserve the status quo so the court can decide the case. And so one of the things these preliminary injunctions are doing against both administrations is trying to preserve the status quo. So there is, a, there is, there is some connection with the logic of the preliminary injunction. But I also think you're right that d the earlier you decide it, this goes back to Professor Bode's point about pre-enforcement challenges, the earlier you decide it, the more fact-free the question, then the more it looks like you've got to decide the whole thing in gross rather than tailoring your remedy to the particular parties and the particular facts. So thank Oh, oh, Dave, do you want to jump well, in? Well, uh, yeah, let, let me jump in because I think this, this ties really nicely to, to Will's point as well about whether we would want to do this, you know, in effect ex ante or ex post or whether we want this sooner rather than later. Um, and I think, um, you know, the concern about the sooner, of course, is that it drains the vigor from government. Uh, and that's a real problem, especially in a world that, like it or not, is built around executive lawmaking uh, at this point. But, and this goes to my point about there being really deep and difficult trade-offs here, which is putting off any kind of a judicial reckoning until later also has costs. And the problem is that policies, especially social policies, can create their own constituencies. They can have entrenchment effects. This is certainly true of the ACA, right? Once the ACA is up and running for a while, it becomes politically popular, at least um, in, in certain places and maybe in the majority of places. And so that's that's a really difficult trade-off. And I think it's I think part of this debate then is, is trying to figure out how to negotiate that trade-off. And, it, and it's very much a question of timing. And I think that both Will and Tara really hit, hit the nail on the head in, in raising it. So let's uh, join, please join me in thanking both of our speakers. <laughs>